and so it's 1.30 p.m., so it's time to do 55 minutes of business right here on Business Incorporated. Here's what's coming your way in the next 55 minutes. We'll start from Nigeria, where IMF shares outlook for the country after a mission visit. true that 70% of financial crimes are linked to the banks in Nigeria. We'll have a conversation on that. And then we move over to Kenya where unfortunately their reserve drops as they try to buffer the shilling. Good afternoon. Welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Start from the commodities market globally, oil prices fell for a second day on Tuesday as pledges by China, which is the world's biggest crude importer, to transform its economy amid stuttering growth since the COVID-19 pandemic failed to impress investors and they're concerned about slower consumption. Brent features for May fell $0.03 cents to $82.77 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate dropped $0.11 cents to $78.63 a barrel. Brent settled $0.75 cents lower at $82.80. That was on Monday, while the WTI settled down $1.24 at $78.74 a barrel. China has vowed to transform its economic development model and curb industrial overcapacity while setting an economic growth target for 2024 of around 5%. And that's similar to last year's goal and in line with analyst expectations, according to an official work report that was released uh, today as part of this week's meeting of the National People's Congress. U.S. crude oil inventories are expected to have increased last week, according to a preliminary poll, while distillates and gasoline stockpiles were forecast lower. And still in the global space, Chicago soybean features slipped on Tuesday, surrendering gains from the previous session as bountiful supply from South America weighed on market. Corn and wheat features also failed to sustain an overnight rise fueled by bargain buying. The most active soybean contract on the Chicago Board of Trade was 0.3% lower at $11.51 for half a bushel after rising 0.3% in the previous session. And wheat fell 0.22% to $5.62 for three quarter of a bushel after rising 1.1% on Monday. CBOT corn fell 0.06% to $4.29 for three quarter of a bushel after rising 1.2% in the previous session. Corns and beans are getting support from dry forecast in South America, while lower Russian and EU wheat prices continue to weigh on U.S. wheat prices according to market traders. And uh, well, in Australia, it's wetter weather, and that should boost production of uh, winter crops. Still talking about uh, the greens right there. From there, we go to the metals market where gold prices steadied near a three-month peak on Tuesday, supported by subdued U.S. manufacturing and construction spending. As investors are with testimony from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Paul and key jobs data later on this week, spot gold was flat at $2,114.59 per ounce, hovering around Monday's levels of $2,119.59. That marked its highest point since December the 4th. Meanwhile, U.S. gold features edged up 0. Point, edged lower, beg your pardon, 0.2% to $2,121.60. London's gold price benchmark has hit an all-time high of $2,098.05 per, per uh, troy ounce. Uh, that was in the afternoon uh, following an auction. And spot platinum fell 0.7% to $890.95 an ounce. Palladium dropped over 1% to $950.13. Platinum should regain its luster. And the ongoing substitution of platinum for palladium and strong auto sales uh, is, being, is also affecting prices. Spot silver fell 0.8% to $23.71. Ounce. And then we come to Nigeria, where the International Monetary Fund has deemed Nigeria's economic outlook as challenging, 
with 8% of Nigerians food insecure after a mission visit to Lagos and Abuja between February the 12th to the 23rd, 2024, to hold discussions for the 2024 Article 4 consultations. The mission reports that economic growth strengthened in the fourth quarter of 2023, with GDP growth reaching 2.8% uh, for that year, but uh, this falls slightly short of population growth dynamics. However, the fund expects improved oil production and an expected better harvest in the second half of the year to be positive for 2024 GDP growth, which is projected to reach 3.2%. Although high inflation, naira weakness and policy tightening will provide headwinds. IMF warns that the capping of fuel pump prices and electricity tariffs below cost recovery could have a fiscal cost of up to 3% of the GDP in 2024. The team, however, welcomes the Monetary Policy Committee's uh, decision to further tighten monetary policy and the MPC increased. Uh, remember that the MPC increased that uh, MPC, that's, uh, NPR by 400 basis points to 22.75% for a total tightening of 1,025 basis points since May 2022. Well, still staying in Nigeria, not a very good news, as we see that the EFCC chairman had said about 70% of financial crimes that go on in the country has been linked to the banks. Uh, he disclosed uh, that this significant uh, portion uh, had been traced to the banks. We do not, he did not share proof, but we want to delve into this and some other issues around this to see uh, how this could be working. Uh, the chairman of EFCC, Mr. Ola Ulukoyedi, highlighted the growing prevalence of uh, uh, fraudulent activities within the banking industry, which presents substantial challenges and concerns for the commission and obviously uh, for investors' sentiments also concerning the country. Well, let's delve into this. And, uh, well, the man you saw earlier is Professor Labisi Akinhube, is the co-convener of African Sovereign Debt Justice Network. He's also an associate professor of Sheikh School of Law from Dalhousie University. Normally, we'll have this conversation. Uh, I think this is the first time you've been, uh, we're doing physical. Indeed. It's been a Indeed. while you Indeed. came to the country. It's been, and it's nice to be with you in the studio. Uh, good to be here. And how has it been, being home, back home? You know, it's excellent. Nigeria is home, and, you know, it offers its comfort. It offers its challenges, but they're not insurmountable. Mm, but, uh, I mean, they're not insurmountable, and yet uh, not attractive or comfortable enough for you to come back home? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> we can have the conversation. I know, I know. <laughs> to put you that hot spot. I mean, so you know, we here, stay back here. It's a lot of love. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, so this is a worrying data we have from EFCC alleging that about 70% of financial crimes actually go through the banks. And if we're talking about leakages at a time like this in the country, then this should be traced. It shouldn't just be a statement that has been made and then we gloss over it and then move to the next issue. Um, but how do you see this happening? Happening. I mean, when you look at the financial uh, technology and, and all of that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ini. So it's, I think it's important to start, like, like you said, uh, that the, the representative of the EFCC chairman that, that divulged this information uh, really left us with the bare and the merest minimum, uh, right? But it is concerning uh, to hear that. And, and from all we know, uh, one way to, to analyze this is to think about this in the context of potential illicit financial flows. Uh, right? The characterization of the, of the nature of their findings involving some national context uh, and some context internationally suggests uh, uh, certainly a flow of money uh, in various forms across uh, and within the country. Uh, and what, what that potentially means is that in some cases, this is outright money laundering. Uh, in some cases, it could potentially be tax evasion in terms of invoice mispricing. Uh, 
uh, in other circumstances, it is just sheer misbehavior and fraud, right, uh, that they have uncovered. Again, it's important to be cautious. We don't know what the specifics are. Uh, but one thing that is common is that illicit financial flows uh, do affect the economic financial stability of any country. Uh, they undermine it. Uh, they do contribute to increase in inflation. And so some of the challenges, economic hardships were seen uh, in the country that every day Nigerians are, are talking about really may not be unconnected with some of these findings that EFCC uh, has started divulging. Mm. And, and, you know, it's so scary because, I mean, almost everybody, we're talking about financial inclusion, almost everybody has, no matter how small, an amount of money in the bank. So you want to ask, is my money involved? Is this going to uh, mean that I will lose some of my money? Is it those charges, you know, that sometimes you cannot explain, you just get a debit a lot and you've been charged for, you know, so it becomes a worrying thing. And, and the bigger picture is that it paints a wrong or a scary, uncertain picture for investors whom we are trying to attract into the country? Uh, yeah, so I mean, a very good question, and uh, you've put this at two levels, right? So let's look at the individual. The everyday Nigerian is, uh, should certainly, right, worry if they don't know the technicalities of banking details. Uh, and so what I think is clear from the statement that was put out is that they did not say that the banks are in danger. Nor did they say that the banks have been the drivers, right, of this, uh, of this particularly concerning. Uh, they have just been the conduit, right, and the extent to which it can be, uh, uh, you know, concealed uh, and made look right means it may not be easy uh, for banking staff that are not very well trained uh, in unearthing those kind of issues to really see it. Uh, so I think for, for the average Nigeria, I don't think this reaches the threshold of, uh, of the banks being in danger, right? Uh, our banks continue to be or some of the, or your in funds danger. in the bank being in danger, indeed. Uh, to, the, to the investors, right, which is, which is a big group. Look, I think, I think it's, it is not breaking news to say that we have a somewhat concerning record, right, of, of corruption, which, which I think we've discussed before. It's not unique to Nigeria. Uh, but, but it's also the reality that with the terrain they are, they, there are measures in place to ensure that there are investments that make its way into Nigeria gets repatriated and, and that it's not necessarily uh, going to be a challenge to, to ensure that the proceeds of their investment, right, makes its way uh, to wherever they want it to be. Uh, so I I think, yeah, it raises the flag, but, but I think what the EFCC may, ta may have done, and with addition to the regulatory efforts that the CBN is putting in place, is you see they are trying to address uh, these shortfalls and, and its hydra-headed nature uh, in the institutions, financial institutions that are concerned. And technology should come to our aid here. Well, people still manage technology, uh, yeah, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's often said, right, that a lot of this uh, uh, corruption-related activities can be addressed through, through technology. I agree. I actually think if well applied, it can be. But it can also be manipulated, right, to the extent that these are not AI-generated. Uh, Even with uh, AI, I mean, it's humans who write the programs, who fit the machine, and, and all of that. Absolutely. So... So it, it, it comes back, right, to the people uh, and to the thinking uh, about the, uh, the wellness of, of the country, the greater good of those involved. The fact that if you are uh, tasked with that responsibility, uh, the lens through which it should be viewed should be the good it brings to the greater number of the people and the subjective way uh, in which a lot of our supposedly what should be objective financial institutions are on uh, is what has in part led to these kind of challenges and the limitations that innovative ideas have had really lies what, what at the What do you mean by limitations of innovative ideas? So, for example, you've mentioned technology, right? Uh, the fact that you can, uh, through, so, so let me go back to illicit financial flows, right? And you think about, uh, you know, 
invoice mispricing, right? The, the situation that goes around. Uh, there are audits, right? Firms, uh, individuals that can take account of that. They can take advantage of serious level of technological facilities, software equipment, right? To track. Uh, but if, if it is undermined, if the goal is undermined by the persons taxed with it, there's certainly a limit to which that innovative technology deployed in the sector can achieve those goals that it ought to achieve. And so the, the, the people element, the agency of the humans involved cannot be underestimated. Their mindset, right, and growth about the goodness that this might bring for the people cannot be estimated. I am not being utopian, I should say. Uh, these ideas uh, do not go off on a whim, uh, but but certainly we can do better. Mm. But you, you, you know, having EFCC um, expose this is wonderful, but I guess the bulk still comes back to EFCC and ICPC. So now that you have this number, what have you done with it? What investigation have you carried? Have we seen anybody being punished because the person was part of that 70% of illegal financial flows yes. you know so others maybe could deter yeah. not all not, not everybody at least some people i guess the box still comes back to to the desk of efcc uh, yeah so you're right the let's like, let's again you know separate them we don't know where they are with respect to this investigation right uh, they might have given this information in the context of the training or so that was going on to, to say look we aren't something uh, but we have enough evidence to say you've done investigations in the past where you found persons right that are culpable uh, but your prosecution of these cases has left a lot uh, to be desired of your capacity to truly uh, do what you're supposed to do. Uh, we can look back at what I would consider as the you know, early days, uh, uh, two, three, four presidential tenures back. Uh, and you can think about the name of EFCC. When EFCC uh, will be a terror. Exactly. That's, and they that's used to leave the need, news bulletins. That's where we need to get to, right? And so uh, following uh, this, it's not enough to divulge information. They are not a ministry of information. Uh, you know, the ICPC, the EFCC have to take the prosecution seriously and of course they need the courts to support them so these all uh, trigger the responsibilities of various agencies of government including the third arm of the government the judiciary to do its own part and do it expeditiously right and and be punitive where necessary rather than a slap on the wrist that might just mean you know maybe we can carry on with this uh, yeah behavior. and then uh, later we can give a percentage of what we took and then we move on with our lives that, that's not where we want to be <laughs> <laughs> i think that's no, yeah, well, that's how we do that, but you know, <laughs> okay. then we don't want that. Yes, lot. obviously. Yeah. All right, Professor Labisiaki Bay, a convener of African Sovereign Debt Justice Network and also Associate Professor at Sheikh School of Law in Dalhus. It's good to have you in Nigeria. Thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy your stay. Yeah, Thank you. I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now let's move to another issue of concern. We've been hearing the Oronsonye reports, the Oronsonye reports, we are cutting cost of governance. Um, we need to do something about it. Then the president has said, yes, we are adopting the Oronsonye report. We're supposed to have a committee, but we still have um, new appointments in spite of that. We've heard uh, uh, the executive say there will not be job losses. And now we see that some civil servants are afraid of job losses. There's going to be merger and, and all of that. We had this conversation on our, our sister program, Sunrise Daily, uh, Morning Brief, and all of that. But now let's delve to the business side of it and see how this could affect stakeholders. And uh, joining me for that conversation is lead partner at Cardinal Professional Services, Emmanuel Nosami, uh, joins from Lagos, but virtual. Hi, uh, Mr. Nosami. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Ine, for having me this afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm fine, I'm fine. So the Russia reports, well, you know, it's, it's, I think we have heard so much about it and uh, the promise of merger and, and all of that. But could you just share with us, does it look like this is really going to bring about a cost of governance? Because um, there's been arguments, we've heard that uh, the executives say, There'll, there won't be job losses, so there won't be fear in the town, and there were going to be mergers and all of that. Do you see it actually bringing about cost of governance? Because I do know we've had new appointments, even after, you know, the directive of the president that uh, a Russian report should be implemented. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ini. You know, let me say that uh, beyond scoring the political points with the implementation of the Orange Soil Report, you know, uh, the first thing we need to uh, identify is that if we want to sincerely get the benefits from that report as recommended by the committee that put the report together, you know, there is no way there won't be any form of job losses. You know, we've heard from uh, every quarter that uh, from the government that uh, they, they are planning not to uh, have any job losses because if you go to the objective of the report, you know, is uh, streamlining the <laughs> bureaucracy in the uh, civil service and the inefficiency that is also inherent in it for the purpose of cost, uh, cutting down, you know, drastically the cost of governance. So if we must truly implement, you know, the RSA report, there is no way, you know, there won't be uh, job losses. You can imagine, you know, uh, a surviving entity having two permanent secretary, you know, as the case may be, you know, those kind of possibilities will not be there. I think, you know, transparent communication around implementation is needed and carrying stakeholders along in a manner that uh, will lead to a win-win transparent outcome, you know, for everybody see it leading to a win-win so we do not want people to lose their jobs but we also want to reduce the cost of governance and to free up some funds for developmental uh, projects in the country and uh, of course as you have said this this report is about 10 years old or so and things have changed you know when you compare the realities how do we make it relevant to today and impactful to the stakeholders Okay, uh, let me give you some data, you know, so that you can appreciate uh, the things that have changed. As of today, we have over five trillion, you know, being expended by annum as payroll costs, and we have over 1.5 million uh, people on that uh, payroll. You will recall that when the president came in, you know, and inaugurated the ministers, we also had some additional ministries that we don't use so have before. That means that, you know, even this current government itself has also added to the number of uh, workforce. But the big question on the table is that, you know, just like if you mirror the private sector and uh, ask yourself the sincere question that, you know, uh, with this large uh, civil service and the cost of uh, running the civil service, are we getting value for this side of the uh, civil service as a nation? I think your answer is as good as mine, you know, considering every sector of, of the economy. You know, that suggests that we have a lot of inefficiency, you know, going on there. And there is need for us to cut down on the recurring, you know, salary cut expenditure that the government um, is uh, 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 incurring. You know, and that is the, is the, is the first thing I, I want you to, uh, uh, to note. The second thing is that, you know, the savings as estimated by your answer your report itself, you know, by now, is the, it must have been doubled. Remember that uh, uh, minimum wage as a 2012 uh, was like 18,000. Minimum wage is currently 30,000. You know, and even after, uh, as at that time of the report, we only have about, um, you know, uh, 560 something, you know, MDAs, you know, uh, in the civil service. But now it has led to oversee about 96 MDAs, you know, uh, in the civil service. So if you look at it, you know, beyond going into the letter of implementing the Orosa report, we may need to even reevaluate the current situation in order for us to get the benefit of uh, implementing uh, the report, you know, for the purpose of saving costs for governance. But like I said, you know, <clears throat> it has to be a win-win process. You know, uh, you will agree with me that currently today there are some people you know, in the civil service that are interested in, you know, getting out of the civil service for the purpose of uh, running their own business as, as an entrepreneur, you know, I think this is, if this presents a golden opportunity to first identify the set of people and possibly, you know, have the Ministry of Labor putting programs in place that can reskill, retrain, and prepare them, you know, for life after civil service, such that their severance pay and whatever benefits you want to give to them, uh, you know, for living in civil service can be used for the purpose of that entrepreneurial drive. You know, that we uh, presents a win-win, you know, conversation between the stakeholders and the government in the process of uh, uh, doing this, among other measures that the government can also ensue, you know, so that it can uh, mirror a win-win outcome.
Mm. Sounds like a lot of work for the committee that would have to implement this. Who and who do you think should make up that committee in order to bring these innovative ideas to create a win-win situation for everyone? Yeah, definitely the key stakeholders, you understand. And uh, the key stakeholders here are the employees, obviously, which will likely be represented by their unions, uh, the trade unions, and then uh, every union they have at their ministries or the department level. You know, government itself, the federal government itself, is also a major stakeholder because you, want, you don't want to implement this report and then efficiency at the, at the, at the, at the federal government level dips significantly because we are not able to do it you know, very smoothly. Also, you will agree with me that the receiving uh, a, a ministry or department or agency, as the case may be, in the case of major or some zooming, you know, some agency into another, you know, also has some cultural issues to deal with, you know. And these are the stakeholders, you know, that has to be on the table. I believe strongly that the Ministry of Labor has a very strong role to play uh, in this implementation and, you know, uh, rallying around everybody to see to it that communication is very strategic, you know, selling the vision to the stakeholders so that everybody can buy into the vision for the purpose of the general good in a way that doesn't leave them worse off. You know, the biggest fear of everybody in the civil service as of today is that if you name me of what will I jump to? Remember that, you know, the skill set of people working in the civil service cannot, are not easily, to, you know, transferable, you know, to the private sector for some cultural, you know, differences. And that's why, you know, I said earlier that there will be some retraining, some reskilling, and some entrepreneurial empowerment, you know, to really position these people in a way that, you know, they can buy into the idea and also find it as a way of contributing more productively into the economy and also empowering themselves beyond just sitting in the civil service. Mm. So I, I wonder if Cardinal Professional Services has taken uh, some time to calculate like about how much the country can save if this report is updated to capture today's realities and implemented, you know, to create a win-win situation. Uh, do we have an idea how much perhaps that could be a motivation, you know, to pursue the implementation? You know, FG has not approached us to do that job, but from a high-level perspective, you know, uh, what we see is that, you know, according to the report, you know, uh, the Honorable report has it that within a three year period, as at that time between 2012 and 2015, you know, there could be some savings up to 900 billion, you know, in uh, wages, you know, that government is currently expending, you know, settling civil servants, you know. Uh, but looking at the trend, the growth in inflation over time, and the fact that minimum wage has been revised twice, even after that period, you know. We estimate that the savings, considering the you know bloated number of people moving from about like uh, 720 employees on the payroll in 2022, now having over about 1.5 million people on the payroll, you know, if you look at it, you you can agree with me that you know perhaps there, 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 there could potentially be you know uh, a savings in excess of a trillion naira, you know, from this initiative, and that is why it is worthy, you know, of uh, you know consideration. And uh, I believe that the committee that has been started with this responsibility, they are able to get every stakeholder to buy into the vision for the common good, you know, and also for the purpose of empowering themselves, you know, uh, uh, most importantly for those people that have been living the civil service, you know, and that potential one trillion per annum is significant enough to stimulate some other aspect of the economy if the government is sincere about the implementation. All right. Uh, well, one thing we can do is throw that one trillion naira and say, well, we can save one trillion naira. Imagine what that would do. Perhaps that would be a motivation, you know, to pursue uh, not just the creation of the committee, but the real implementation of the Orosoye Report. But thank you so true. much. Uh, lead partner, you wanted to say something? No, no, I said true. Your comment is true. Okay. All right. Lead partner at Cardinal Professional Services, Emmanuel Dosomi. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me in it. All right, now let's head to the market now and see uh, how those numbers are looking this afternoon. Mostly intraday numbers that we see there. The NGX is sustaining the bullish sentiment it closed with yesterday. And yes, we're now at 99, uh, but it doesn't look like we're going to cross to 100 today. But uh, 
Well, let's keep our fingers crossed and hope, be hopeful. A 0.23% in the green is what the market, the NGX, gained, uh, while South Africa is in the red, 0.32% at 72,000, drops from the 73 that they gained yesterday. 72,401.75. Look at other markets. Now, Egypt is very positive, 1.59% at 30,723.67. Kenya uh, head back to 93 points uh, at the close of trade on Monday after it gained 0.12%. Uh, hopefully we'll see 100 here uh, in no distant time. We're looking forward to that for Kenya. Then we move to Middle East and, and, and see that it's a mixed uh, although mostly negative sentiment for intraday. Abu Dhabi is in the red, 0.31%, 9,256.54. Dubai also in the red, uh, very red, I see there, 1.71%, at 4,252.52. Other markets, Saudi Arabia, the only positive at intraday for the Middle East, 0.23%, at 12,463 .56, while Qatar is back in the red. Uh, really red there, almost 1%, 0.93%, at 10,376.12. We move uh, to the United States stock features ticked lower on Tuesday. And, uh, well, NVIDIA is back in the news, uh, very back there. Let's look at the numbers. Dow Jones is in the red. S&P uh, 500 also in the red. NASDAQ, uh, well, I get, I mean, NVIDIA is a major driver of that. In our after-hours auction, we saw that shares of JITLAB tumbled more than 20%. And uh, we also saw that software companies company uh, posted a weak forecast for the full year during Monday's main trading session. And chip makers NVIDIA and Super Microcomputer continued their run, gaining more than 3 and 18 percent, respectively. That's from NVIDIA and Microcomputer. Meanwhile, other mega cap tech names struggled, and that's why we saw that uh, NASDAQ is at 0.73 percent in the red. From there, we'll go to Asia, where market has closed for the day. China's stocks hit over three-month highs after the country set its economic growth target. We talked about that uh, during the commodities segment. China has a new vision that they're pursuing now. Uh, they said the country will boost its defense spending by 7.2% in 2024. They expect inflation to rise, but they are targeting 5%. Uh, for their growth. Looking at the number, yes, yesterday the K25 hit a new high and it's sustaining that, even though it dropped a bit as uh, profit taking, catching up on it there. 40,097.63. Cuspy also in the red. 2,649.40. 0 0.93% in the red. Hansen, 2.61. That's a huge fall right there for Hang Seng. We look at other markets in that region right now. We we'll see Australia. Uh, well, it doesn't look like we have the number. Oh, thank God we have it. Shanghai up 0.28%, while um, Australia is in the red 0.15%. Let's head to London now and see what's happening there. Good to have uh, Juliana. Juliana, good afternoon. Uh, we learned that Jeremy Hunt is going to be delivering a budget tomorrow. I know by now, being a journalist and a good one that you are, you'd have been getting a bit of the news, what to expect at tomorrow's budget speech. Right. Speculation is rife in the British media about what we can expect in tomorrow's spring budget. And that's because, of course, we are going to be heading to the ballot box any time now in the United Kingdom. So tomorrow's spring budget is likely to be the last big fiscal event of the year uh, for this Conservative government. I think it was about an hour ago that we saw uh, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt meeting with uh, King Charles III at Buckingham Palace, uh, which is um, part of the ceremonial um, aspect of uh, the King being the head of the government. He isn't going to say much, but certainly I think the Chancellor would have given him some insight in what is to be expected tomorrow. And as I said, speculation is running rife in the media because over the past six months, both the Chancellor and uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak have been speculating that perhaps there will be some giveaways. I think if you look at any national poll 
at the moment. It does show that the Tories are about 20 points uh, behind um, the opposition Labour Party. Everybody's expecting that Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, will be um, the next Prime Minister. And to prevent that, the Conservatives are trying to make sure uh, that they can provide as much tax giveaways as possible to anybody um, who will stick with them. And that is the kind of fiscal navigation that Jeremy Hunt is going to have to try and balance tomorrow. I think just before I came into the studio, there was some breaking news that perhaps uh, there is going to be another um, cut in national insurance. We had a 2% cut, I believe, last time uh, during uh, the autumn statement. There will be a further 2% cut that is likely going to uh, save voters about 450 to 900 pounds a year. But is that enough? Is he going to go any further than that and cut uh, the rate of income tax, which is what really squeezes uh, workers here in the UK? In fact, I think if you earn above £50,000 in this country, you have to pay about 40% um, of your income uh, to um, the coffers. Uh, so lots of speculation. As I said, lots of pressure. We know that we are in a shallow uh, recession in the UK. I think uh, GDP in the last quarter uh, fell by 0.1%. That uh, followed a 0.3% fall in Q3. Um, we just had retail sales figures as well this morning from the British Retail Consortium showing that retail sales have slowed yet again. So there is lots of pressure on the Chancellor and on the Conservatives to, on the one hand, make sure they do cut tax because that is kind of a symbol of the Conservative government. But on the other hand, um, fiscal responsibility is the reason why we have this Chancellor in the first place. There is only so much headroom because, of course, if you start cutting tax, you then cut in other areas such as public spending. And we have heard from the Office for Budget Responsibility as well as the International Monetary Fund that any cuts to public spending is not fiscal responsibility. And to boost the UK economy, you've got to invest there. Uh, so that you can bring up all of the country rather than just a few. Uh, so, yes, uh, we'll just have to wait. All eyes are going to be on Westminster tomorrow after PMQs at about 12.30 local time mm. when Jeremy Hunt will deliver this all-important statement. Yeah, well, it sounds like a very sensitive balancing there that uh, the yeah. governments will have to do. But let's look at the market and see how that's doing. The market's not doing great um, at intraday. As I said, everybody is on a budget fever in the UK. In fact, there have been some open letters uh, written by the business community um, asking uh, the Chancellor to see sense and finally cut business rates. Of course, the high street has been battered since COVID and a lot of business leaders uh, believe tech giants that are able to use warehouses and not, um, you know, invest in, in stocks and water um, are basically uh, winning uh, the battle. So they want some support there. That's uh, uh, caused some anxiety on the markets at intraday. The all share is down 0.18%. The FTSE 100 down to at 0.26%, but the domestic market, the FTSE 250, any, that's up by 0.23%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading down against the US dollar by 0.04%, down to against the euro by 0.03%, and the British pound is down against the Japanese yen at intraday by 0.07% in A. Thank you so much, Juliana, and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, All right, let's move to the EU now, where they're looking to use profits from frozen Russian assets to buy weapons for Ukraine. I wonder what the law has to say about this, because I know this is a little bit of a contention, you know, going by uh, past incidents. But let's have Chiponda now, Chiponda Chimbelu, joining us from Berlin to give us the details. Hi, Chip. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Any. Well, there are expectations that the EU could release a proposal this week on how to use the interest and investment gains from frozen Russian assets to arm Ukraine. Now, that's according to a report by German business daily Handelsblatt. This is, of course, an idea that has been floated around in recent months. In fact, last week, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen mentioned it in her speech to EU lawmakers on Wednesday. The Russian central bank has reserves worth around 200 billion euros at the Belgian clearinghouse Euroclear. Interest and investment gains from those reserves were 4.4 billion euros last year. 
The argument in Brussels is that the gains do not belong to the Kremlin because it has been sanctioned by the bloc since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine two years ago. EU, law, EU lawyers believe that accessing these funds would not violate the principle of state immunity. But central bankers have warned that any attempts to do so would be misguided. Yeah, well, the central bankers do have a problem with this as well as the law. What are they saying? Talking about the central bankers. Well, any proposal by the European Commission to use those funds would have to be approved by its 27 member states. And that is something that could prove tricky. The bloc's three biggest economies, Germany, France and Italy, are in favor of using Russian funds to help Ukraine. But Hungary could block the plan. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban is Russian President Putin's closest ally among EU leaders. And Hungary has already opposed many EU initiatives to support Ukraine. So whether Brussels would be able to get every country on board, especially Hungary, is hard to say. What is clear, though, is that the bloc needs the money. EU countries have been disagreeing over an additional 5 billion euros to help support Ukraine through the Commission's European Peace Facility. Yeah, well, sounds like a lot of work. Let's look at the markets now, Chip. How's that looking? Well, any European stocks are expected to trade lower today. Investors are looking at the news from China's National People's Congress. Beijing has set an ambitious GDP growth target of 5% for this year. Now, it's a goal that analysts are skeptical China will be able to reach. They say it will put pressure on Beijing to inject more cash into the economy to bring back confidence amid the ongoing property slump. And in terms of company news, German farmer and agricultural giant Bayer is in focus. The company fell to a 2.9 billion euro loss last year. Now its CEO says he will not break up the company. Instead, he will focus on improving its operating performance. All right, Chip, thank you so much for that. Talk to you tomorrow. Now let's move to some other African countries. Now the United States has terminated uh, Zimbabwe's sanctions program and reimposed curbs on nine people and three entities, including the country's president, over their alleged involvement in corruption or serious human rights abuse. Washington is seeking to make clear that the sanctions are not intended to target the people of Zimbabwe with Monday's move. Among these targeted with fresh uh, sanctions where the president over involvement in corruption, as well as Sakunda Holdings, a Zimbabwean firm, which uh, the Treasury said has facilitated state corruption, as well as fossil agro and fossil contracting. From there, we go to South Africa, where that country's gross domestic product as the GDP experienced a modest increase of 0.1% in the fourth quarter of 2023. Notably, transport, storage, and communication sectors surged by 2.9% during the same period, contributing 0.2% stage point to the overall GDP growth. Economic activity saw boosts in land and air transport alongside transportation support services and communication sectors. The statistics in general, Rusenga Maluleke addressed the media earlier to discuss these developments. Industry that uh, uh, performed the most was transport, having performed at 0.2 of a percentage point, followed by mining and quarry, as well as personal services and finance that contributed 0.1 of a percentage point. But those that uh, had a drawdown in the most were trade at uh, negative 0.3 percentage points of a percentage point and uh, followed by agriculture at negative 0.2 of a percentage point. And indeed, we can see that uh, it's just a coincidence that transport happens to have grown the strongest and indeed contributed the most. But there are times when the growth, uh, the 2.9 that we are seeing of growth, sometimes that growth is not correspondent to the contribution that uh, such a sector has made. Now, uh, we want to make comparisons. 
and it's the first time we bring these kinds of cons comparisons to be able to demonstrate that uh, what happened in the third quarter on the left hand side and what sustains as we report on the fourth quarter we can see for example that uh, in the area of trade we can see that uh, perhaps right, right up there with agriculture uh, it's a second uh, quarter from the third quarter it had indicated a negative growth it continues to show a negative growth and of course uh, we can see that construction shows the same trade shows the same but there are those that have moved uh, sideways and indeed when we look at uh, the sectors we are saying that uh, the primary sector is the one that contracted by 2%, whereas the secondary and tertiary sector retained a growth of 0.2%. All right, so from South Africa, we'll talk about sugar. Well, uh, last week we heard how the price of sugar was surging, and now we have a report from the FGC saying, that's financial derivatives company, saying that the uh, global price of sugar has fallen by 5.24% uh, to $20.62 a pound, uh, year to date. Let's find out what's happening with Miriam O'Day. Hi, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon. Tell us what's going on. The domestic market, uh, their complaints of the price of sugar surging, but now we see globally that it, it, it's dropping. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. So yes, last week we saw the global price of sugar actually increase, but this week we're seeing it's like declining. And this is even in comparison to December's um, price of 23 cents per Found. And the reason why we're seeing this decline in the um, global price of sugar is mainly because of increased um, cane production in Brazil. So that's why we're seeing um, um, the price of sugar actually declining now. But remember, they're still like um, lim or undergoing factors or underground factors that are pushing, that are still keeping the price of sugar elevated, like the congestion at Brazil ports. Um, Brazil's um, port, which is preventing um, the bumper harvest from Brazil to reach the global market. So currently, um, global price of sugar is still elevated, but it's falling. Yeah, so um, we know that uh, there's been efforts here in Nigeria to reduce the um, consumption of sugar. There was a sugar tax and all of that. And then there are also efforts to reduce the importation of it. What's the situation now? Um, I know that in 2022, the government actually imposed a 10 um, Naira per litre tax, um, same tax on um, sweet um, beverages like carbonated drinks in a bid to reduce the demand for the commodity. And we've even seen recently that uh, many organizations are actually um, clamoring for an increase in this level of tax so that um, demand will fall um, further. But we know that in countries that have actually implemented this tax, like Mexi um, Mexico, um, Chile, um, even the UK, despite the introduction of this tax, we're still seeing um, high levels of um, obesity and um, di um, diabetes, which is actually the main reason why this um, tax was introduced in Nigeria. And then for importation, Nigeria still imports a whole lot of the um, raw material needed for the production of sugar to meet with its domestic demand. Um, we import over 90% of raw sugar materials for domestic needs. Meanwhile, um, we're still, we see um, sugar refineries like Dangote Sugar Refinery, they are refineries that are trying to increase the production of sugar, but this is still insufficient to meet up with domestic demand. And this is why we're still seeing increased level of importation because in Q3, um, sugar still, Q3 2023, sugar still remained one of the top imported commodities accounting for 1.86% of total imports into the country. Yeah, unfortunately that, uh, Miriam. Thank you so much uh, for your time with us. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, let's head to Kenya, where unfortunately Kenya's foreign exchange reserve has dwindled back to below $7 billion. That's about 1.019 trillion shillings of that country uh, for the first time in five weeks. And that's reversing an upward trajectory and signaling reduced capacity for monetary authorities to support the shilling. Data from the Central Bank of Kenya indicates that Forex reserves declined by $259 million. That's about 38 billion shillings to $6.96 billion. That's more than 1 trillion shilling as of Thursday last week. That's a 3.6% drop 
from 7.22 billion. That's 1.05 trillion uh, shillings a week earlier. The country's forest reserve had hit the highest level in over five months on February the 22nd, coming on the back of two concessional foreign loans that also saw the shilling rally against major currencies after nearly a year of free fall. Well, it looks like loans will always have that artificial buffer and it only lasts for a short time. You know, countries will certainly have to increase their exports if they really want to buffer their, their reserve. What's happening in Nigeria, happening in Kenya and a lot of African countries. In Nigeria, happening in Kenya and a lot of African countries. It's now time to go to the crypto space. Uh, one day, one news. One day, one news. <laughs> Binance and, and Nigeria. Uh, Ladi has the latest news. Uh, Ladi, I don't want to be the one to let the cat out of the bag. Uh, it's your conversation. <laughs> and I, I don't know how it's affecting. I mean, you always speak to your guys here. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them in Nigeria, some of them have jackpots, though. Right. But now, uh, this, this will certainly affect them. Yes, this is uh, definitely another big blow to most of the traders um, that trade cryptocurrency on, on Binance. So we're hearing Binance there dropping support um, for the Naira What does uh, that pairs. mean? Meaning, um, normally, if you could uh, trade um, maybe your Bitcoin or your USDT, you could trade that into the Naira if you're trying to escape maybe volatility, you know, from the U.S., uh, from other... You know cryptocurrencies so you just buy you just convert that to convert to your naira, naira to usdt no you USDT. convert your cryptocurrency to ngn which is the naira, naira. so and you, you have that and feature. we know that the naira is one naira is always going to be equal to one naira so that way you save yourself from volatility but you can still be hit you know from the fx market you know if the naira actually weakens but it's it's a it's a it's a but now you bunch cannot of directly do that you can't do that anymore but from the is... 8th of march okay from march. from the 8th of march you won't be able to you know trade okay, your cryptocurrency you guys... into naira you guys need to collaborate with nigerian governments yeah i think yeah Let's blow. The, the crypto communities <laughs> need to find a way you know at some point because the u.s had binance u.s maybe yeah. we need binance, binance nigeria, nigeria. to have its regulations exactly. that will be customized to suit Nigeria. To suit Nigeria, mm -hmm. just like that. All right, let's look at the um, headlines at this point. There we have the, the cats out of the bag. You know, Binance um, announces uh, phase out of the NGN support. They did announce that in an official um, tweet uh, today. You can uh, get that uh, tweet up there. You see, um, they actually you know confirmed that. So it's no longer hearsay. Everyone's looking for um, you know get that direct information on what's really going on. And there you have it, Binance to discontinue all Naira-related um, services on their platform. Um, that's the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, crypto exchanges um, right there in the world. Let's bring in um, Gilbert Jopata now, financial market analyst, to explain what this means and uh, what's going to happen going forward. Great to have you, Gilbert. Yeah, great to be here, Mr. Ladi. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another day, another Binance uh, story. And this time, uh, Binance have come out with an official statement um, dropping support for the Naira on their exchange um, platform. How is this going to impact uh, traders in Nigeria? Well, you know, after facing uh, increased scrutiny from the Nigerian government due to the allegations that was placed uh, on, on Binance, uh, Binance decided to uh, discontinue uh, services, you know, and business with the Naira. This is more of uh, an effort to show their commitment to compliance and transparency in in their operation. And, uh, you, you know, deposit actually ceases today. Uh, that's by 2 p.m., few minutes from now. And then withdrawals uh, for, for, for the Naira will cease on, on Friday, which is March. But uh, halting the, the services for the Naira on Binance is quite a, a significant development for uh, Nigeria. And also it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the broader uh, challenges and, and impact of, uh, of crypto uh, businesses going uh, fully compliant. But then the impact of this service uh, of, of Binance, which is it stopped doing business with, uh, with the Naira, I think first of all, the impact will lead to an emergence of new alternative. And, you, you know, this comes in two ways. There are other businesses of uh, big crypto exchanges as well, which, is, which have uh, do services to Nigerians, but then they were not uh, good enough to compete with Binance. I think this time around, it will give them uh, an opportunity. You know, in the forest, once the biggest uh, uh, tree in the forest goes down, it creates room for air and also sunlight for other 
trees in that forest to grow as big as that giant. So we, I think there will be an emergence of new alternative. Uh, but then for the local market, we also have a local crypto uh, exchanges that offer peer-to-peer -peer, uh, service. But then they were not even a match. They couldn't come close to competing with Binance or giving the kind of services which Binance give. So I think this will also give an alternative to uh, local crypto businesses that also offer such uh, services. And then I think this also plays a uh, uh, an emphasis of compliance and then risk management because the cryptocurrency industry in general in the entire world is going more uh, compliance. You know, the regulatory uh, guidelines and compliance is being made available all over the world. So as regulatory landscape also emerges and get better, uh, cryptocurrency investors and traders need to understand uh, more of, uh, should I say, more of uh, risk management themselves in uh, trying to do businesses with more of uh, crypto businesses that are more compliant. Uh, some of that thing I think will also face uh, limited trading volume in terms of the Naira in the, in the cryptocurrency, uh, in exchanges that actually offer services here in Nigeria. Right, and, and definitely um, when most traders uh, want to maybe cash out some of their profit, I guess they won't be able to do that anymore in the Naira. Well, there are actually other ways you could do that if you want to. But then uh, the, the issues which the Nigerian government had was the allegations of, uh, of uh, manipulating the, the exchange rates. So uh, if, if Binance have seized this and then we had that, uh, that challenge of maybe, you know, Binance may, may be guilty or may not be guilty as charged, but then if that challenge of uh, a big exchange as Binance manipulating the, the exchange rate is, is being uh, curtailed, uh, there are other services out there which one could always use to exchange his crypto uh, assets or USDT back to the Naira at the end of the day. Yeah, still a developing story at this point. We'll keep tracking um, this whole uh, Binance and P2P saga in Nigeria. Thank you so much, uh, Gilbert Rapata, financial market analyst. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ms. Ladi. All right, quick uh, glance at the market now. We we'll see it's still um, really bullish. If we put up, we we'll see uh, extreme greed, 90 points um, right now. Remember how to use uh, fear greed index and um, traders wait to the see extreme greed before they take profit or buy into the market. And Bitcoin, they're sitting at $66,516 um, earlier today, 1.53%. So um, it, it, it's quite interesting that this is coming at a time, you know, the <laughs> clamp down on Binance. When, when the lot of... <laughs> Bitcoin and the whole market is really, really bullish right yes. now. So you can imagine some of those traders that are in profit at this time. And, and they cannot. Might not be able to take mm. some of that profit. Well, but I, I who think knows? it's a message of hope uh, from, from uh, Gilbert saying right. that there are other ways. So this is the time to get close to, you know, consultants and all of that and perhaps find a way. Yeah. But I do wonder how... Um, this is going to uh, look like in the next few months because you know Nigerians always find a way around it. See if there's no more pair to pair right. to affect the forex rates at least for pair to pair. Yeah. But what about you know? At least uh, you when, don't have to go to Binance again to go look for uh, what the exchange rate is <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Exactly. You find your own exchange exactly. rate. Exactly. Find your exchange <laughs> rate. All right, Daddy. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of Business Incorporated today. So much news, so much uh, that you can gather. So just go back to our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash channels web so you can uh, just you know consume it at your own rate and then we'll do it again tomorrow 10 a.m laddie williams will be here 1 p.m i'll be here but i'll see you tonight stock market report join me then